You're watching Straight Talk Africa. Hello and welcome. I'm Heidi Adams. From Mali. And Chad. To Guinea. And Sudan. Are military coups and takeovers making a comeback in Africa? This week, we'll look at what's behind the latest series of failed and successful coup attempts on the continent. We'll also speak to young Zimbabweans about that week in November 2017, how their generation experienced the end of the Mugabe era and what's been called one of Africa's most peculiar military takeovers. We'll have expert analysis for you and your opinions. Straight Talk Africa starts now. back in Africa? It's a question that has come up more and more lately. This year alone, there were coups in Chad, Mali and Guinea. And on October 25th, Sudan was added to that list. Military and civilian leaders in that country were supposed to share power after a 2019 popular uprising which overthrew the dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir. But an attempted coup in September laid bare the divisions and mistrust inside Sudan's leadership and major differences between backers of pro-civilian and pro-military rule. So when that country's top military official, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, deposed civilian Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok, dissolved the cabinet and declared a state of emergency, were the people of Sudan really surprised? I asked Nabil Biagio. He's a reporter with Voice of America South Sudan in Focus program. He's lived in Sudan for most of his life and has reported on the country's politics for years. It wasn't surprising because the stage was set for a showdown between Sudan's civilian and military partners in government, in the transition government. In addition to the difficulties the transition government was already going through, economic uh, difficulties, uh, uh, they were struggling to establish institutions of democratic institutions of government to conclude an, an incomplete uh, peace agreement. In addition to that, uh, and, and there was a growing discontent among people, uh, the people of Sudan, that the government was not delivering, at least not fast enough. In addition to that, now we had an element of insecurity, a coup attempt, a terrorist incidents, and so uh, you had a recipe for a coup. And for all of Sudan's independence, which is 65 years, 52 years out of those 65 years, Sudan has been ruled by the military. November, the month we're in right now, is the deadline the military was supposed to hand over the chairmanship of the sovereign council to a civilian official. It's like the presidency, which is shared among military and civilian officials. That deadline was approaching uh, those insecurities incidents happened and analysts at the time in September, they feared that the military was going to use that to assert its role in, in politics and, and, you know, establish its, its dominance and say civilians are not ready to take over things. Where it was surprising was the haste with which the military moved. It was, uh, uh, all. It, when it happened, it felt like it was just overnight. I also asked Biagio about the international response to the coup. The United States has frozen $700 million in emergency assistance to Sudan, and the African Union has suspended the country's membership until civilian rule is restored. But are these regional and international responses tough enough? And is Khartoum likely to feel the consequences? Uh, the short answer is not really. Uh, a very interesting statement came out and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates called for the immediate restoration of the civilian government in Sudan, the lifting of state of emergency, the release of all detainees. It was interesting. I spoke with an analyst who told me it's significant because 
uh, these two Gulf countries are very important to Sudan. Uh, the military had to have known that the West was not going to accept the coup, especially the US. We saw that immediately. And now the whole international community is condemning the coup. The military is more or less looking to save face. Uh, Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok might be reinstated. He would have to form a government of technocrats that the military uh, may find palatable so that uh, they, they don't see that the coup uh, has been completely undone, like they can't, it's, it will make a fool out of them. And that was reporter Nabil Biagio from VOA South Sudan in Focus team speaking to me earlier. Now to Burkina Faso, where the legacy of its late president Thomas Sankara looms large. Known as the Che Guevara of Africa, Sankara was a celebrated, charismatic revolutionary who seized power in a popular coup in 1983. He promised to tackle corruption and the dominance of former colonial powers. But after only four years in office, Sankara was gunned down in another coup in 1987, in one of the most infamous killings in modern African history. Now a trial into Sankara's assassination is underway in Burkina Faso. And the main defendant is the former president, Blaise Compaore, Sankara's close friend and ally. Compaore, who now lives in exile in neighboring Côte d'Ivoire, is not attending the trial. Henry Wilkins reports for us from Ouagadougou. Aluna Traoré is the lone survivor of an attack that killed former Burkinabi president Thomas Sankara and 12 others in October 1987. Traoré was Sankara's legal advisor. This is the spot where Sankara, still considered a national hero in Burkina Faso, died. As he revisits the site, Traoré remembers the day of the assassination. Shots were being fired and we were told to get out, get out, get out, get out. The comrade president got up, adjusted the tracksuit he was wearing and told us that he was the one the attackers were looking for. He went out that way, the same door he came in. He came out of the room with his hands up, outside, without a weapon. Analysts say Sankara was a popular figure who had a big influence on how governments were run in the region. He came to be known by some people as the Che Guevara, if you like, of West Africa, with a big focus on grassroots issues. So really focusing on the well-being of ordinary people. Fourteen defendants stand accused of carrying out the assassination or conspiring to, including former top-ranking military officials and politicians. The prime defendant, Sankara's successor as president, Blaise Compaore, will not be in attendance, however. Compaore was ousted in a coup in 2014 after 27 years of rule and has been in exile in Ivory Coast ever since. His lawyers denounced the trial as political. A previous trial for the Sankara assassination was held under Compaore's rule but the judgment was also dismissed as politicised and invalid by the transitional government after Compaore was ousted. One of the lawyers for the Sankara family expects the trial to last four months and says they have amassed irrefutable evidence against the defendants. There are a lot of testimonies that have been heard among the military, the civil, the political. There are many witnesses who are heard among the military, civilians, politicians of the time. Oui, euh, juste un exemple, euh... For example, the driver who drove the commandos to the execution, he is alive and testifies very clearly on this issue. Témoigne très clairement sur cette question. Matri Mathieu Somme is representing one of the defendants, Gilbert Diendere. Vous avez un contexte qui rend difficile le travail des juges. The trial is being held in a context that makes the work of judges difficult, a context in which there are prejudices. People have already made their judgment, thus jeopardizing the presumption of innocence, the main principle of a fair trial. Nonetheless, the trial has gripped the country. Like many, Traore is anxious to see what truth will emerge. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Wakadugu, Burkina Faso. And as Burkina Faso looks for answers about a deadly coup that happened decades ago, 
and Sudan deals with the aftermath of a military takeover just weeks ago, we're asking, are military coups making a comeback in Africa? Should the army ever be in control of government? And can a coup ever have good consequences for ordinary citizens? I discuss these and other questions with my guests. Gentlemen, I do thank you for joining me. Allow me to introduce you to our viewers. Kenneth Mwenda, no stranger to this show, is an adjunct professor of law at American University here in Washington, D.C. And Fonte Akum is the executive director of the Institute for Security Studies in South Africa's capital of Pretoria. A warm welcome to Straight Talk Africa to both of you. Professor Mwenda, I'll put the burning questions to you first. If we look at the recent events in some parts of Africa, I'm talking Mali, Chad, Guinea and Sudan to name a few, are coup d'etats making a comeback in Africa and will they be with us for the foreseeable future? Yeah, thank, thanks for that, uh, Heide. Um, I really wouldn't say that coups are back in Africa. Um, what I would say is that history has a tendency of repeating itself. Um, there are various factors and conditions which necessitate or invite a military coup. Uh, a lot of studies have been done, uh, starting with, I think, uh, Feiner's book, Man on the, on the Horseback, a while back. And much of the studies are focused on internal factors that uh, lead to a coup, but there are also external factors where there is intervention from especially former colonial powers. Um, and it can be a combination of both internal and external factors as well. So the one sort of universally agreed principle is that we have seen that coups are most uh, common in countries or regions where there is instability. Okay, instability is a good ground for a military coup because the military, general, generally speaking, are very well organized. Uh, much of management theory and leadership theory draws from how organized the military is. Uh, so they take commands, they follow commands, uh, execution is very efficient and effective. So this is what you don't get in civic institutions easily because of democracy, human rights. Everybody has a right to do what they want to do. But the military are very effective in terms of how they're organized. So they're able to carry out these swift and, you know, um, sudden decisions uh, to take over government. Uh, but by and large, I wouldn't say that military coups are coming back to Africa. It's just a question of history at some point repeating itself. And Fonte, give us your take. What exactly is behind the recent spate of coups we've seen? And are there any trends or parallels or differences that you've seen, um, you know, in regards to the military takeovers today and those in early post-colonial decades where these types of power grabs were rampant? Well, um, I think, first off, um, there clearly is a difference because the institutional frameworks around the continent, around questions of democracy, good governance and elections have evolved quite a bit um, from the days of the organization of African unity through the African Union. That's a first difference. Uh, the second is the regional economic communities have also been built as um, a bulwark um, for certain norms to be advanced across the continent as well, including norms of collective, in collective security and um, the defense against instability. So that changes the nature in which politics is practiced in the different countries, but also ways the frameworks which allow for certain degrees of decisions to be made affecting countries within these regions. So before um, the founding of ECOWAS, for example, and you saw the initial coups in places like Ghana, Nigeria, and so on and so forth, <laughs> It's very different from the coups we have seen recently in Mali, in Guinea, um, on constitutional change of government in Chad, and what we are seeing in Sudan. And the difference um, is, first of all, that we need to look at all of these in a specific political context within which they are taking place. The two coups we have seen in Mali in August 2020 and in May 2021 are slightly different from the coup that we saw in Guinea and the coup we are seeing in Sudan at the moment. Um, one difference is the triggers that brought the coups. Um, in a place like Guinea, um, there were 
growing concerns about the unconstitutional ch the change of the constitution by the former president Alpha Conde, which basically ushered in what we could describe effectively as an unconstitutional change of government to allow him to serve a third term. Wow. And beneath that, the way in which he structured security sector reform in Guinea and created a specific special forces unit provided the footer for a unit that could actually oust him on the back of popular discontent. If you look at Mali as well, what were the triggers to the coup? The June 5th uh, movement in Mali allowed for mass mobilization around three key questions. The first was economic stagnation and discontent. The second was growing insecurity. And the third was corruption and, and um, sort of these um, undermining of the rule of law in Mali by the ruling elite, which basically led the military to ride a wave of popular discontent to come to power in the first case, and internal tussles led to the second coup. Sudan, of course, is a different case, right? Because the inter internal chasms between the civilian and the security constellations within the transitional government basically ushered in um, a power struggle, a power struggle which the military, as Professor Mwenda very well said, as organized as they are, would easily oust a civilian counterpart. Professor, do you see a connection between the coups and attempted coups we're seeing of late and this survey by Afrobarometer of voters in 18 African countries in 2019 and 2020 that found that most Africans say they want elections, but far fewer think they actually work? Now, I know you said coups today are a sign of history repeating itself, but do you think we can also draw a connection between this waning faith amongst people in the effect of the ballot box and the return of military takeovers in some places and the way coups are received and perceived by ordinary citizens. Yeah, thanks for that idea. To, to a large extent, what we are seeing is that um, the misconception that uh, the introduction of multi-party politics, as it were, is equivalent to democracy. Now, that was the thought of the day in the early 90s. And Zambia was one of the first countries to move from a one-party state to a multi-party democracy. So there is that misconception that if we have multi-party politics, then we are a democratic country, which is not true. Uh, we, you need to build institutions of democracy, uh, robust institutions, checks and balances. Uh, so there is quite discontentment coming out in most of these countries uh, because of issues of rampant corru corruption, okay? Uh, and then you have weak political parties uh, that are trying to re wrestle for power. So the most sort of powerful, you know, ally of the weak political parties is often the military. So the military will step into that space uh, very easily. So corruption is one of the biggest things that has uh, brought about this discontentment that, you know, elections are not delivering what we expected they would deliver. Uh, you know, the one thing we have to understand, uh, especially for the former colonial powers is that you can colonize the people, teach them a language, but you cannot teach them how to govern themselves. Uh, you know, some of these values, norms, and institutions of governance, they have to, of course, borrow from best practice, but as well as from indigenous uh, practice, what we call constitutional autochthony, homegrown constitutions, for example. Uh, but this is a very jurisprudential philosophical issue that sometimes we miss the point. We are coming from traditionally leadership norms and institutions of chieftaincy. And then suddenly you throw onto us Western democracy and all these norms of human rights, whereas our legal thinking and philosophy has often proceeded on the basis of responsibilities and duties more than rights and entitlements. So they, they, there's a big chasm there. And so even the thought leaders, intellectuals, we need to rethink uh, how we approach these issues of democracy. And this time, is it more of a regional or continental phenomenon, or are we seeing history repeat itself in other parts of the world too? Not, not, not necessarily so. I mean, we have Myanmar, uh, formerly Burma, you know, um, they have, right now they're going through stuff. Uh, they had a military coup over there. Um, Latin America, uh, starting from the late 50s, uh, you know, we had uh, Batista in Cuba, who was then... Uh, pushed out by Fidel Castro, uh, the Anglo-American influence in Mexico, 
you know, uh, we had um, Chile, Allende, 1973, uh, was overthrown with influence from external forces. Um, you know, getting closer to home, you know, we have had uh, countries like Mali where there's been, you know, two sides of the argument that, you know, some Western forces are coming in to deal with uh, Islamic fundamentalists. Uh, others are saying, look, they're actually intervening. So sometimes external forces intervene, not necessarily to protect the interest of the people, but to push for a favored candidate who they believe they can work with as a, as a president. I don't want to mention countries, but we, we all know where this has happened. Uh, and we know some of these scenarios. I, I can give you many examples. Look at, for example, the removal of Patrice Lumumba, uh, democratically elected prime minister of uh, DRC. There was a lot of unease in Washington. There was a lot of unease in Brussels. There was a lot of unease in London when Lumumba came to power, especially with his fiery independent speech. Uh, so we have seen this. Thomas Sankara, uh, you know, uh, in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, you know, although he also came to power through a military coup. Uh, and Sudan so far in Africa has had the largest number of military coups. I think they have had about eight. And of those, I think seven have been successful, one unsuccessful one. Uh, worldwide, Thailand has the largest number of military coups. Uh, so there's a culture of military coups, you know, in some of these places. Even countries as progressive as South Korea, they've had to go through that in the past. Um, so this phenomenon is not unique to Africa. It's... Um, it happens in many, many parts of the world. But most importantly, it's more common in uh, sort of in economies and political cultures that have a lot of instability or they have not settled well. Uh, if you look at the African continent, much of these military coups are found mainly in West Africa and North Africa, especially in the Francophone-speaking countries. Uh, Burundi is Francophone. Um, Lesotho had a, an attempt. Zambia had an attempt. Zimbabwe, I wouldn't even call that a military coup, although there's many people want to call it a guardian coup. They, they try to distinguish between a veto coup and a guardian coup. But in, a, in my view, that was simply an attempt. The reason why I say that is that a military coup involves taking over of power from a leader uh, and is carried out by an agent of the state, like the military. Uh, but in case of Mugabe, the military itself was very clear that they had not taken over oh, power. They had just frozen his powers, you know, forcing him to actually hand, hand over power. Uh, secondly, when a military coup takes place, the number one thing that happens is that the constitution is suspended. You suspend the constitution and you issue military decrees and you appoint a military junta. That's a typical scenario of a military. You don't waste time delaying as if you don't know what's happened because when you don't, if you keep on with the old constitution, basically what that means is that the people who were elected by you know, the electorate are still in power. You know, and therefore, whatever you're doing is illegal. The best thing is to suspend the constitution you bring into what you call jurisprudence. Hans Kelson's theory is a grund norm, a new grund norm, which is a new constitution. So everything now falls under that new grund norm, which is the military dictates. That's how a coup is. But in Zimbabwe, none of that took place. And I want to come back to the point about what makes for a successful versus a failed coup a little later on. But I'm wondering, Fonte, can you walk us through what a coup really looks like, uh, you know, for someone who doesn't come from a country um, where they've had coups, um, you know, in my home country of South Africa, we haven't really had a coup. So for people who don't know what that looks or feels like, can you walk us through the sort of playbook of a coup d'etat? I, I imagine it begins with something ominous in the air, am I right? I mean, that something is about to go down. Um, increasingly, we see civilian governments which actually depend quite a bit on the military to maintain power. And often, those arrangements come tumbling down on the back of civilian discontent. But to pass the litmus test of not being ejected from regional economic communities of the African Union, then they use a civilian security actor um, which I describe as a securitarian actor to take power and say we have a civilian at the helm. It happened in Mali, where after the uh, military took power, they went and got a retired colonel um, to sit in as the civilian head of state, who was then deposed in May 2021. So I think we need to be careful about those arrangements which are meant to hold power 
and uh, which then um, play against the civilian authorities which depend on a security establishment in order to govern. Now, how does a coup take place normally? Normally, um, at least what we are seeing in recent times is sort of a governance decay, progressive, accompanied by a lot of discontent behind the scenes, civil society actors, first of all, elections are rigged. Um, and then civil society actors um, take to the streets, um, but then they are either dismissed, co-opted, or repressed. Um, you go through a couple of cycles of those, and then the options for change of political power become very limited. Add to that a decline in economic fortunes, particularly in countries that depend on natural resource um, endowments. And that decline pushes the button a little further and tightens the screws economically, reducing the capacity of the state to engage in the patronage systems which maintain them in power and generally push the state towards repression. Um, in that case, you see a rise of discontent and a limited room for maneuver for changing power and getting the kinds of outcomes that populations want. If you look at the case in Mali, um, the case in Guinea recently as well, um, there were ways in which these factors played into the military, stepping out of the shadows and saying, we are doing the will of the people. And what happens in that case is, as it happened in Mali, um, you cut off access routes to the main city, and normally um, power is very well centralized in most of our capital cities in Africa. And once those access routes are, are, are cut, um, sections of the military, which are loyal to the president, are basically put at bay. So they don't have access to providing the lines of defense that the president might need to either escape, to be able to reassert authority from elsewhere, or through regular contestation. And as Professor, as Professor Mwenda noted, there is the legal process that follows. Once the president gets taken, the push is for the president to actually resign and if you look at the difference between Mali and Guinea, for example, the president dissolved all the institutions of state and then resigned. If he had resigned before dissolving the, 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 the instruments of state, then he would have resigned and lost the capacity as the president to dissolve the institutions of state. And that gave the military the capacity to take over power. In the case of Guinea, Alpha Conde refused incessantly to actually resign and relinquish the authority of state because endowed within the president are certain constitutional powers. Once that takes place, there's, um, there's the suspension of constitution. There is also, um, depending on how the military reads um, new information technologies, they resort to cutting communication access, they close the borders of the country, and then wait for the regional economic community, according to terms of subsidiarity, to come in and negotiate a transition. At the same time, in a little cabal or a little council, they sit together and decide the terms that they would like to dictate for the transition. Most often than not, they start off with terms that would allow them to either usher in a transition or allow them to be part of that transition and even part of the post-transitional process. This are the different um, sort of mechanics of coups as we have seen um, in, in on the continent lately. But the problem is, again, we have to look at them from very context-specific, through very context-specific prisms, because it depends on the military configuration in the country. It depends on the military's relation to political power. It depends on the military's relation to state and society in these countries. And those different factors determine exactly how the playbook is used. And I'll have more from my discussion with Kenneth Mwenda and Fonte Akum after the break, as well as your comments on social media. Do stay with us. Straight Talk Africa. We'll be back in a moment. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. 
This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Welcome back. We're discussing the spate of military takeovers and attempted coups we've seen in African countries in recent years. Should the African Union and regional blocs like ECOWAS do more to anticipate and prevent them from happening in the first place? Here's more now from my discussion with Fonte Akum from the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria, South Africa, and Kenneth Mwenda, adjunct professor of law at American University here in Washington. And Professor, as I listen to Fonte, it does remind me of something you said earlier about why more often than not it is the military mounting the coups. I mean, how ever nefarious the actions might be, they do require a level of organization and structure and ability that, yes, the military would be completely equipped to pull off. So why do some coups succeed and why do others fail? Yeah, um, very interesting point. Uh, first of all, let me agree with my colleague uh, Fonte there. Uh, we do have some military coups which um, involve uh, civil society, for example. That, that does happen. It's not always through the military. Uh, but what is important is that a coup, the definition of a coup, has to come from a state agency, not from outside, from a state agency. That's a military coup takeover. Um, now, the state agency could be a minister, for example, a disgruntled minister who rallies... Uh, you know, support from others and then takes over. Okay, it doesn't have to be a military general. So that can happen. Um, but then we also have to be mindful of two things. Uh, number one, for a, for a coup to be successful, the intervening state agency must be in full control, must take over full control. Secondly, they must have effective ability to carry out decisions of the state, not waffling around, uh, saying we've, we've arrested Mugabe, but you can't make decisions. Mugabe is presiding over a graduation ceremony, but you said you took over power from him. You know, those type of things. Then the international community be begins to question. And closely tied to military coups in international law is the concept of recognition of governments and states. You can recognize a state, but not the government. Okay, so when a military coup takes over, Certain countries are hesitant to recognize immediately. They'll probably give provisional, what we call de facto recognition by acts. You are simply implying that you recognize these guys. For example, in uh, Burkina Faso, I remember that when Kampaore overthrew his friend Sankara, he flew to Lusaka, Zambia, to meet uh, President Kaunda, and Kaunda refused to meet Kampaore. I was at university at the time, around in the, in the 80s, yes. Kaunda refused to meet Kampaore, he flew back. Kaunda was trying to signal that at this stage I do not, the government does not recognize your regime. When you come to factors which make coups fail, one of the things is where there is a very limited uh, support from the large populace, okay? So legitimacy, the, the, the issue of political legitimacy is very important. And legitimacy comes in two forms. One, through use of ideology, or secondly, through use of force, okay? So if there's no legitimacy around the change, you know, you can see, for example, a coup crumble down. Secondly, where you have uh, limited uh, international support and approval, uh, you know, power pressures coming from Africa Union, ECOWAS, international community, say, re release this person, release that, 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 you know, even local people are not satisfied, you know, that can crumble also. Um, so there are various factors. And some of the things that have taken place in a number of countries which much of scholarly literature seems to downplay is issue of ethnicity and tribe. Mm -hmm. That can also spark it, uh, you know, a military coup, especially in the armed forces and uh, defense forces. If, for example, they feel that a certain tribal ethnic group is marginalized, you can see those minorities begin to galvanize support amongst themselves to use the military as a vehicle to take over power. Uh, these are things that you, you don't find in Western countries. We can all relate because we are from Africa. But you, you tell a, a, a European-American scholar, he may not easily grasp the impact of these things. You have to be or live there as an American or British or Australian to understand the dynamics of tribe and ethnicity in Africa. I mean, I just have to point at Rwanda for you to know what happened. And I'll come back a little later on to those ethnic tensions and the potential for mutiny there. But Fonte, coming off what the professor just said, do all coups and military takeovers necessarily have bad consequences for the citizenry of a country? I mean, can there 
ever be such a thing as a good coup? Are the negative connotations to coups always justified? I mean, could ordinary people ever perceive a coup to be a good thing? Um, fascinating question. Um, very context specific again. Um, and um, I would dare say if you look at the different coups that were organized by Jerry Rollins in Ghana, for example, um, then you would say there was a coup somewhere that has ushered in a couple of decades of democratic consolidation, despite the challenges that Ghana faces today. However, in a lot of the countries um, that Kenneth has pointed to, Francophone African countries where we see coups today, generally, because of the very construction of the state in these countries, coups are absolutely, we can say almost beyond any reasonable doubt that coups are never really a good thing. Um, now, maybe um, our expectations on the political outcomes of coups could change over time and could change with the new crop of coup leaders. But I'm not that hopeful either. Um, when a 37-year-old colonel takes over power in a coup, he has approximately three to five years to become a one-star general, right? So if he takes over power, where does a political transition of three, four years leave this individual? And what role do they play? I mean, these are key questions, right, from an individual level. Beyond the individual level, it's about the respect for the rule of law. How do we engage on questions of the rule of law when a military is managing a transition? The third question that is often asked is, if the military is at the presidency, then who is stopping violence against the state, right? Look at the case of Mali. Who is fighting the terrorist if the military is in the presidency? Um, so these are key questions. Um, and of course, the fourth question, which I want to come back to, is the economic one. Where has a military coup ever delivered on the economic promise of any country? Right. So there are political questions which are linked to sociological questions and economic questions as well. And I'm a pessimist when it comes to coups delivering on any kind of democratic consolidation across the continent. It seldomly happens that um, a coup would be perceived in a sort of uh, positive light. Uh, and the reason is very simple. Uh, norms of democracy, uh, most of the norms are universal. They are context specific norms, but most of them universal declaration of human rights. There are certain inalienable rights that we cannot you know, debate about, the right to life and so forth, uh, freedom of expression. You know, those are not debatable across the board. So once you begin to see um, abrogation of human rights and so forth, which the military often does, people begin to question the relevance of these things. However, there's a footnote there. We have seen some progressive regime change through military, for example, Cuba, Fidel Castro, one example, Burkina Faso, Thomas Sankara, that was a very progressive uh, change. Uh, so, but the, by and large, there are few, few of these. These are exceptions to the general. The general norm is that military coups are not progressive. But where you have, um, again, don't get me wrong here, I'm not advocating for military coups, but what I'm saying is there are exceptional instances where this can happen. And this brings about the debate between what we call economic determinism as a school of thought on the one hand and the school of thought of human rights. We lawyers often talk about human rights. Sometimes economists, especially Marxist leftist economists, they talk of economic determinism, which is the concept of an enlightened, benevolent dictator. As long as I can get things done, forget about these issues of human rights. They are delaying my agenda. Okay, I'm looking at the bigger picture. Okay, uh, and that's what some of these guys, the Castros, the um, Sankara, if you talk to the critics of Sankara, they were saying it was intolerant of divergence views of multi-party politics. Okay, it was a monolithic, homogeneous way of looking at issues, a leftist way. So it really depends on your ideological stance uh, of where you're looking at things. But by and large, I agree with Ponte that, you know, military coups rarely, rarely uh, make, uh, you know, positive impact. If anything, they worsen the situation. We saw when Kampaure took over from Sankara.
Fonte, you talked about the African Union earlier. Uh, if you look at how it has responded to coups traditionally through suspensions, uh, condemnations, etc., is that enough? Uh, what's the most effective response that the African Union could and, and should have? Or, or do regional power blocks like ECOWAS or SADC have more influence and more muscle to intervene in these circumstances? Um, interesting question and very topical one on the continent at the moment. Um, for a number of reasons, um, if you look at the resp AU responses um, to the coup in Mali, uh, to the coup in Chad, um, based on Professor Mwenda's definition, what happened in Chad would constitute a coup um, because they did not follow the constitutional processes after the death of the president. And what happened in Guinea, um, the first right of response lies with the regional economic community. And often the challenge that the African Union is faced with is the variable capacities of regional economic communities to effectively respond to peace and security challenges within their regions. ECOWAS has developed a tradition of response based on the Lome Convention to questions of unconstitutional change of government. The economic community of, West, of Central African states, ECAS, um, is not necessarily at the same level um, where, where ECOWAS is. And of course, it's a region from which I come. Uh, you look at Cameroon, where the president would be celebrating, I think, on the 6th of November, over 40 years in power. Um, you look at Chad, where a son su succeeds the father. You look at um, Congo Brazzaville, where um, Denis Sassou had to come back to power um, after um, sort of a civil war. Um, you look at Gabon as well, but that's a sun succession. So often, regional economic communities are the sum total of the governance architecture of specific regions. And so you've got to start at the regional economic community, which has the first right to response before you get to the African Union. And if you look at the regional economic communities and look at the responses to coups in West Africa, for example, you could pick apart the different decisions that have been taken, the naming of a specific envoy to engage with uh, a set of coup plotters. Is that the apt person to engage with these? Um, if you have a coup, if a coup has been organized, should you be sending a former military leader to engage with them, or should you send a civilian? Should you send a francophone to engage in an anglophone country or not? Should you send a lusophone? Should you send a seasoned diplomat or a younger diplomat since the coup plotters are in their 30s and early 40s? These are key questions that factor into how the responses are structured. The second thing is the arsenal of responses at the disposal of regional economic communities have shown effective to drive towards specific outcomes. Now, there is a whole degree of politics that takes place behind the scenes. When a coup happens, a, a transitional council says we would want to have a transition of 36 months, like they did in Mali. The economic community, uh, ECOWAS comes in and says, oh, no, you cannot sit in there for 36 months. We would manage 12. So they negotiate somewhere in the middle and say 18 months. But to ECOWAS, they are looking at 18 months. But to those guys um, in Mali, they are looking at their 36 months. And I want to bet that they are going to get their 36 months. And the second coup that happened would drive them in that direction. So those dynamics matter as well. But for them to have accepted the initial arrangement of 18 months, it was the threat of being cut out economically at a time when almost all economies are interconnected. How do you access foreign exchange if there is a sanction weighing over your head? How do you participate in the community of nations if there is a sanction hanging above your heads? These have proven effective, but then the regional economic community would have to take the lead and provide the requisite support to the African Union, which then supports their decision. So there have been differentiated responses, which some have argued have encouraged other coups on the continent. If you are hard on Mali and you, are, you go easy on Chad, 
then what do you expect to happen in Sudan when a coup takes place? So that differentiation is what's um, causing a little bit of discontent at the moment. Um, so the recommendation would be that there be a uniform standard that, that is applied um, with countries sanctioned and ejected in the event of a coup, and that alters the behavior. So when Professor Mwenda spoke about the case of Zimbabwe, maybe if the ACDEC did not exist, the military would not have seen any obstacles to taking power after Mugabe. But they had to go to the former defense minister um, to actually take over, right? So there are ways in which those statutes and norms actually alter the behavior and transform the negotiations and the transitional processes at the moment. So the AU itself is a sum total of governance on the continent. It's an intergovernmental organization, and you're really not going to expect them to act differently than the government of the continent act. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to wrap things up here with a few predictions, if you don't mind. What do you predict for Sudan? What do you think will happen there? And what are your predictions or your bets for the future of other countries that have up till now been rather susceptible to military takeovers and power grabs? Professor, you spoke about these sort of ethnic fault lines. Yeah, first of all, we, I think lead, our leaders need to be very mindful of how they manage ethnic uh, tensions, uh, tribal tensions, and we should also not forget religious divisions, uh, issues of Christianity versus Islam. Uh, those are very, very critical uh, issues. Uh, of course, there are issues of the economy at play, jobs and so forth, um, and, and other, other issues. Now, also, the other thing that could contribute to military coups is what we call contagion you know, like in uh, banking uh, supervision. If risk spills over to your neighbor, they are likely to catch the cold, okay? So you, you don't want to have any of these countries in a region that has not had military coups start off with a successful military coup. It might spill over. You want to make sure that the region remains stable at all costs. The responsibility falls not only on our leaders, but also on regional integration bodies like AU, uh, Commerce, Asadic, ECOWAS. OK, they, there's need for conscious effort to ensure that we don't have contagion or we don't develop a culture of political military coups where people think this is a good thing to do. Um, Sudan has had the largest number of military coups uh, that have been successful, like I pointed out earlier. Um, I think eight out of eight, seven have been successful, I think. Uh, but we do hope and pray that uh, things will stabilize and normalize. We are very hopeful. Uh, that things will, will normalize. Um, I don't think it would be fair to say that uh, coups are something that are peculiar to Africa. No, it, that would be a very unfair statement. We see these things in all regions. We've given examples of Latin America, uh, Pacific, Asia Pacific, we've given example. Fiji, for example, had had military coups. Um, we've given examples of Thailand. Has, Thailand has the, had the largest number of military coups in the world. You know, it's basically coups, it's a, it's a normal thing in Thailand. Uh, so it's not unique to Africa, and I'm quite hopeful that, uh, you know, going forward um, with this, you know, guidance of Africa Union and all these other partnering institutions, the AU and so forth, um, EU and so forth, we should, we should come out good at the end of the day. Um, it's just a question of history repeating itself. We learn from these lessons, and we should do better next time. And Fonte, what's your prediction? Well, give me a second so I could go get my crystal ball. <laughs> Listen, um, <laughs> um, it, it's extremely difficult um, to predict. Um, and the, outcomes, the outcome of the coup in Sudan, for example, is going to depend very much on internal dynamics within the country and ways in which civil society actually mobilizes, um, how the neighbors react, and the kind of support that this current Sudanese junta would get from the Gulf states and Egypt, and also the response um, of the international community with the degrees of sanctions upon which Sudan depends at the moment um, for its foreign reserves, as well as the African Union as well. So the global concert of nations would actually determine a lot of these outcomes. Um, I think we should be hopeful. Um, the reason being um, the norms that have emerged on the continent um, since tw um, 2007. First of all, with the African Union, which is going to be celebrating 20 years next year, 
um, the ACDEC, which um, was enshrined in 2007, has actually altered the way in which the military actually conceives coups, conceptualizes them, and executes them. And so there is a degree of dissuasion based on the architectures. Now, look at the coups that we have seen over the past couple of years. What do they have in common? They're coming against the backdrop of COVID-19. And I'm not saying that they are COVID coups, but there clearly is a situation within which economic pressures, social unrest, political discontent actually comes to a head within a context where there is political impasse and no way forward. And the military then gets emboldened. And guess what? During the context of COVID, the shuttle diplomacy that normally takes place is limited to a certain extent. You have video, video conferences, and you depend on very little numbers of diplomats to engage on these issues. And I think that provides some kind of room for maneuver for junters as well. So as we emerge out of um, the shadows of COVID-19, I think we should be hopeful that with the institutional frameworks, with the normative constructs on the continent, and with the ability to engage in mediation and diplomacy, we would see a, re a reversal in this pattern over the next couple of years. Fonte Akum, Executive Director of the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria, South Africa, and Kenneth Mwenda, Adjunct Professor of Law at American University in Washington. Gentlemen, what a great pleasure it has been to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your perspectives and thank you so much for your time. And we asked you on social media, given what we've seen in Africa recently, do you think we'll see fewer or more coups on the continent in the future? Let's read some of the comments we had here on Facebook. Tom Kato in Uganda says, clearly times have changed for the worse in Africa. The dreaded military coups and insurrections are back in Africa. The African Union and other organizations have become impotent. The United Nations should come in and alleviate the suffering of the people. Andrew Allen is in Malawi and he says democracy in Africa doesn't work at all. Poor people are on the same level since some countries gained their independence. Divine Tukov in Nigeria says at times we prefer the coups than these old dictators in Africa. James Nyogoli from Uganda says coups are currently a necessary evil in Africa and we need to start afresh. In Tanzania, Al-Kalaus Muta Ishengoma says as long as the coup is removing puppet and inept leaders who are caring for themselves and their colonial master's interests, let coups spread to all African nations. Ukotijia Gideon from Nigeria says there's going to be an increase in coups because African leaders are very greedy for power and they are corrupt. And then there's this one from Nuer Diang. Since there's no peaceful transfer of power from African leaders, coups will remain the only viable option. Kondek Fobdek says, well, since neither the United Nations and ECOWAS have done anything to put measures in place in order to prevent further coup attempts, I believe there will be more coups coming. And Timothy St. Bumba says, we need more coups in Africa. Elections have failed in Africa. And we do thank you for all your comments. We received so many comments in reaction to that question, but you can check the rest out on our Facebook page. It's time now for a short break. And when we come back, we'll hear from young Zimbabweans about the 2017 military takeover that ousted former President Robert Mugabe. How did they feel about the future of Zimbabwe then? And how do they feel about it now? We'll have their stories when Straight Talk Africa returns. Welcome back. On the evening of November 14th, 2017, military vehicles surrounded key parts of Zimbabwe's capital, Harare, and reports began to emerge that the country's president, Robert Mugabe, was under house arrest. The military, who also seized control of the state broadcaster, insisted it was not a coup. But on the streets, there was celebration, 
as Mugabe, who had ruled Zimbabwe for 37 years, resigned under military pressure. For many young Zimbabweans, it was a momentous event and an opportunity to envision a new era for that nation. Now, on the fourth anniversary of that week in November 2017, Konstantin Waltz asked two young Zimbabweans how they felt about their country's future then and how they feel about it now. So when uh, Robert Mugabe was outside, you know, there was hope. Uh, people celebrated, uh, thinking that it's because of an individual. So that individual mentality that we had, that, you know, if we deal with this individual, everything is going to go. I think most of the people celebrated this general feeling. I really looked forward to a change in the system of governance. Where we are having people being able to express themselves freely, where we are going to have freedom of speech, where we are going to have freedom of gathering, where we are going to have freedom to affiliate yourself to a political party of choice. So I must say that uh, for me, it was, you know, a good step in the right direction, not realizing that, you know, the future was, you know, is the future is uncertain and the, what is at stake after a coup is much larger than what happened, you know, before the coup. <laughs> conversation that we never had is Mugabe is going then what? So we did not have the conversation around the fact that this is a coup. What does it then mean to us, the rest of uh, the generations to come in Zimbabwe a few years later? So yeah, Mugabe was leaving and people were happy about Mugabe leaving but the conversation that was never had silently is the then what conversation. I had hoped to see um, the rule of law, but that is something that we did not see. I was hoping that with Mugabe's reign uh, coming to an end, it could signal the birth of, the, of a democracy and the birth of a democracy starting with the rule of law. So we're hoping that, you know, post uh, Mugabe era, we're going to see a basic social, you know, services being delivered and also Socially, we are also expecting that as, as people who are going to come together and be united in coming up with a common goal, because the social fabric was totally destroyed. You know, there is no trust between us and those who are governing. We didn't change systems. We just changed individuals. We just inherited the system. We are fighting against corruption. We are fighting against this. But a lot of these things that we are fighting against are actually being uh, perpetrated by the people that we entrusted our governance with. Now is the time for us all to unite as a nation. And a change which will deliver in terms of ushering in a new democratic state that is centered on the pillars of social justice. Now it's a fight towards the transformation of the country. It's a transformative agenda that you must pursue and putting in Zimbabwe into the map of the global context. I strongly believe that, you know, the change that we need and the change that we require is not going to come from the top. It's going to come from the bottom, a bottom to up approach. That is how you build a healthy and a sustainable development for a country where the development is really people centered. I think for us to have political and economic change, we really need to pursue the rule of law in the country. We need to see um, the silencing, the guns mantra of the African Union coming into fruition in Zimbabwe. And if we have the rule of law, if we have the solidarity, and if we have the right political will and mindset towards development and change, I feel like there is a light and hope at the end of it all, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done before then. Be sure to join me on the next Straight Talk Africa. We'll bring you the complex political situation and growing humanitarian disaster in Ethiopia, where civil war has displaced many in that country's Tigray region. VOA's Heather Murdoch takes us inside the largely cut-off conflict zone, as well as refugee camps in neighboring Sudan. So join us for VOA's documentary, Terror in Tigray, on the next Straight Talk Africa. And that is our show this week. Thank you to all my guests and my VOA colleagues who contributed to this week's program. And thank you for always watching and always listening. Until the next time, go well. Goodbye.